Hello, I am here at Troma headquarters with Lloyd Kaufman. For almost 40 years now, Troma's been paving the way for independent filmmakers and making films that we'll say are usually more extreme than most filmmakers would dare to do. Um, in a Troma film, you're likely to see lots of blood and shit. I've done a lot of shit in my videos too. Would you like to share shit recipes? Well, I know Sizzle Beach has got uh, Kevin Costner in it. Are you talking about that? Uh, oh, Tales from the Crapper. Maybe that's what you'd like to you'd like to know. Uh, ta check out Tales from the Crapper. That says it all. And and uh, James. By the way, we're, we're big fans of yours here. At, uh, we're big fans of the Angry Video Nerd here in Tromaville. Very big fans. We masturbate to you constantly. But uh, 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 let me say this about that. Uh, if you need recipes for shit. Uh, just check out the Troma bathroom here, and uh, after Friday, we have free lunch for the employees. Ah. There's some amazing shit. And my book, uh, Make Your Own Damn Movie and Direct Your Own Damn Movie, have uh, secret uh, recipes for shit, for blood, for vomit, for urine, for uh, jism. So <laughs> I think you young people have a lot to learn. Uh, Michael Hers and I went to Yale University where we learned all those things. Uh, speaking of the books, some of the most entertaining and inspirational books about filmmaking I actually read were uh, all I learned about filmmaking, I learned from The Toxic Avenger and Make Your Own Damn Movie. But now there's also uh, Produce Your Own Damn Movie and Sell Your Own Damn Movie. And uh, you want to tell us about those, the newer ones? Well, recently, Sell Your Own Damn Movie um, kind of, uh, I think, is the most visionary of my books. It's better than Direct Your Own Damn Movie. What are you working on right now? What's the newest uh, from Troma? Well, right now we're um, touching up uh, the sound on Return to Newcomb High, which is, as you know, the shot-by-shot -shot remake of Ingmar Bergman's uh, Virgin Spring. Uh, Return to Newcomb High is uh, being made in association with uh, Stars Media, and uh, we're about to mix uh, Volume 1. Return to Newcomb High is an event film, James, uh, an event film similar to Kill Bill with a, a Volume 1 and a Volume 2, and we're, we're about to sound mix uh, Volume 1. We saw the trailer to uh, Angry Video Nerd uh, movie, and uh, most of what's in that trailer you will see in Return to Newcomb High. Thank you for letting us, uh, uh, how shall we say it, file share of your movie. <laughs> uh, do you have a favorite movie monster? I would say Frankenstein, the original Frankenstein, by far. And if you um, check out all I need to know about filmmaking, I learned from The Toxic Avenger, which is a book that James Gunn wrote, that I wrote, um, yeah, you'll see that there's a lot to do with Frankenstein, especially in the creation of the Toxic Avenger, because, like you, James, we always wanted Frankenstein to live. We feel sorry for the guy, for the monster. So, in uh, so Toxie, very much inspired by letting the monster live, among us, and uh, just the whole mood of James Whale and the combining of horror and humor and all that kind of stuff. Very cool. Um, I made a video one time about all the filming locations in the Rocky films, and uh, you were involved with that, the first Rocky, and uh, you were the uh, the drunk guy who uh, Rocky picks up and carries into the, the bar, um, and that happened to be one location that we couldn't find. Uh, do you remember any of that, or just tell us about your experience on Rocky? Well, the uh, director, John Avelson, had made Cry Uncle, which Troma distributes, which is, a, if you haven't seen it, Cry Uncle is a great great movie. It's a takeoff on the film noir, but it's full of sex and violence and, and it's hilarious. And in its day, it's still, the, the, the screenplay is brilliant by David O'Dell, who wrote Dark Crystal, among other movies. At any rate, Avelson didn't have enough money to film on location. So the, the producers were... In L.A., you mean? No, no, he wanted... No, they didn't have money to film in Philadelphia. Oh, okay. And they, they were going to try to fake L.A. as Philadelphia, but Avelson is, is, uh, 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 and Stallone both wanted Philadelphia, so they hired our crew, which had just done Squeeze Play, I think, or, anyway, they hired our crew, yeah, I think, well, I don't know, we had just done a movie, and they hired our non-union crew with us to line produce it, and Michael Hers and Maris were syncing up the dailies from the eight days of filming in Philadelphia, and they were wondering, uh, we had an upright moviola, and we, they were here, I do you know, Davey, Davey, uh, Adrian, the way you blah, 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 and the, and the put, putkas, putkas, and the dog. And they could wonder, what the heck is this? But my mother-in-law, my mother-in-law read the script to Rocky before I uh, started working on it. She said this would be the next Marty, Marty with Ernest, with the late Ernest Borgenine, uh, which I didn't pronounce right, but directed by, uh, I think, Delmar Davies, uh, Oscar-winning uh, movie. Mm -hmm. My mother-in-law saw it. She was right. 
And when Avelson got his Oscar, what a good guy, because most people, when they get the Oscar, they either thank their lesbian partners or, which I would, of course, uh, but they mostly butter up, you know, kiss ass and thank Harvey Weinstein and all that. Avelson thanked me, which is pretty cool, because all I did was set up the uh, Philadelphia, you know, organize it. And it was all non-union. So uh, we shot for eight days, and then the, the Teamsters found us. And then they brought the they brought everything back to L.A. But okay. by that time, we had the the running up the the steps of the museum. We all the great stuff in Rocky. That and the bar where you were at was that Philly. The it, exterior was in Philadelphia. The interior was in L.A. And uh, but the uh, Pat Stakes was Philly. All, all the stuff, uh, the 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 pet shop, the fighting, the punching, the uh, meat carcasses uh, was in uh, Philadelphia. We wow. we got away with about eight days of non-union filming before we got caught, and then they went back to Philadelphia, and oh, okay. the Teamsters then came and broke my legs. The first time I ever heard of a trauma franchise uh, was actually from the cartoon show, The Toxic Crusaders. And I was only a, a little kid at the time. Um, and then it wasn't until uh, later on when I learned of The Toxic Avenger and what it was based on. And um, when you go from the, you know, the film to the cartoon, very, very different. You have one that's more, uh, you know, with lots of sex and violence. And then you have one that's, uh, you know, more for children. It's like, how did uh, something like that get made into a, a show? Well, when you're in this business, every once in a while you get lucky. It's like if you stay at the tables long enough, you'll get lucky. And for some reason, uh, the people making the toys, the uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja toys, um, wanted to get an environmental cartoon. And uh, um, Kevin East, East, Eastman is a big trauma fan. So somehow they decided to make Toxy toys. Wow. And, uh, and then is that where they got the idea of the mutagen from the toxic waste? Probably they thought of it on their own. I don't know. You know, I I can't imagine that they didn't do it on their own. But I'll tell you, a lot of mainstream. You watch a, 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 a RoboCop. You watch everything from RoboCop on, including uh, South Park. You see a huge uh, influence of Toxie, Class of Nukemai, and the Troma Uff. Uh, you'll see plenty of Troma Uff in all of. Uh, much of uh, today's pop culture. And, but the uh, cartoons were very well done, um, mainly because they kept me out of it, and um, I thought they were very original, as is the Toxic Avenger musical, which came out uh, last year here in New York, ran a year, and uh, I think they're bringing it to Philadelphia, actually. Uh, it's very good, and um, they it has the spirit, and the, the cartoons both, uh, and the musical, have retained the spirit of trauma humor but they've been able to mainstream it, uh, the Bon Jovi guy and uh, mm -hmm. and the people who did the cartoons for Toxic Crusader did a great job in presenting the Troma universe in a really very kind of mainstreamish way, but very entertaining. Cool. You ever played the Toxic Crusaders NES game? Uh, I tried to play it, but it was uh, much too difficult for me. It w just wasn't as good as the E.T. Atari game. You know, after E.T. Atari, I just, you know, that was so good that I couldn't play Toxie anymore. Uh, I once saw Toxic Avenger on TV, and uh, they didn't censor any of the nudity, but they censored the gore, like the you know the watermelon with the kid getting run over and everything. Uh, that was all cut out. I, it was on demand. Um, but uh, what could we do to get trauma movies on TV in their full glory? Well, the good news is that, first of all, may I correct you, James, that was not a watermelon. People have been fired because they've used watermelons for squashed heads on Tales from the Crapper. Trey Parker's head gets squashed, and the they kid brought a watermelon. It, it's a cantaloupe because the cantaloupe skin has more flexibility. The watermelon skin cracks and breaks open, so it's clearly a melon. Cantaloupe, if you let it ripen a bit, uh, is, even though it's smaller than a head, um, it's, um, it, it's much more effective. Uh, but I used a honeydew before. Well, honeydew also honeydew if it's really ripe, but again it yeah. cracks open and and it's it's it, 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 it's it, but it it can work if you load enough stuff in it and let it get a little bit rotten. I think honeydew is and it's bigger, it's closer to the head shape. But I stay with the cantaloupe or yeah. maybe the Cranshaw melon. The Cranshaw melon can be pretty good too. <laughs> I, you could we could talk about how to make blood. There's so how many, to crush heads. There, there's so many different ways to do the head crushing. To do how to shit. Well, shit, uh, shit. To, well, yeah, shit too. But blood, especially blood. Uh, I could talk an hour on the bloods for squibs, the blood for uh, uh, wounds, the blood for dead people, interior blood, exterior blood, blood in the hair. They're all different uh, uh, formulas for blood. It's, it's pretty interesting. You know, blood always photographs differently sometimes. Sometimes it's just a weird colored red. What movies do you think had the right blood color, the right hue? Boy, you know, I, I, 
it, it, blood is tough, but um, what what's really awful is that uh, the MPAA rating board, uh, no matter what we did, they would chop our movies up, and if we had any kind of blood in our movies, they would cut it out, even though Die Hard and, and uh, violent mainstream movies were permitted to keep the blood. So we, that's why you'll see in the class of Newcomb High, the monster has yellow blood, and that's where we started using green uh, fluids rather than red fluids, because no matter what, the uh, MPAA would chop it up, and we'd end, we couldn't get our R rating, which meant we couldn't get movie theaters. And in class of Newcomb High, the MPAA made us cut out the one spurting yellow fluid coming out of a goofy-looking monster. They made us cut that out in order to get an R rating. Oh, so they don't like the color yellow also, then? Well, I think they don't like trauma. They don't. The, MP, the purpose of the MPAA rating board is not to protect the the um, the public from uh, uh, movies. It's to protect the uh, uh, the big studios from competition from people like the angry movie uh, movie uh, nerd, the movie game nerd. Uh, I mean, the, the angry video game nerd. Uh, <laughs> I took a lot of acid in the sixties. Well, at any rate, the point is the the uh, the system is is there to protect the uh, the cartel that runs the entertainment and the media. So they'll they'll have a different standard for uh, the major films, and they'll uh, they'll cut out and disembowel the uh, the trauma movies, and uh, they've pretty much won. They pretty much there are virtually no movie studios that have lasted for 40 years. Uh, uh, they're none like us, and most of them come and go. It's not that they make bad movies; it's that they they can't compete with the uh, with the with the the vertically integrated uh, cartel that runs our media and uh, entertainment industry. Okay, trauma films are like party films. They're great to watch with a large group of people. Um, are they anywhere near as fun to make as they are to watch? Uh, trauma films are not fun to make in any way. They're a nightmare to make. And the reason is because we've got thousands of people in them. They tend to have uh, uh, transformations. They, they have special effects. They've got special effects makeup. Uh, and now we've gone into CGI with Return to Nukem High. But um, the main thing is they're very complicated and, and it's hell. And if you want to see it, uh, check out uh, Poultry in Motion. Poultry in Motion is the documentary of Poultry Guys, Night of the Chicken Dead. It's hilarious, but you can see the pain and suffering uh, of everybody in the film. It's totally unvarnished. It's actually Poultry in Motion would be a good uh, thing for students to watch because it really gives you the, uh, the real world of, 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 of trauma filmmaking. There's no... No fun whatsoever, but very creative, and, and it's, it's totally devoted. The team is totally devoted to the cause, which is rather inspiring, but uh, it, ain't, uh, it ain't fun. Yep. I second that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, welcome to my world. With independent films, they seem like they just go on forever because you always got that one shot that you still need, and it just, it just goes on and on and on. Uh, with trauma, how do you keep it such a steady machine going and, and move on to the next film and keep, you know, keep it going? Well, the great thing about the digital age, and I've discovered this with Return to Newcomb High, is you can. I'm a terrible director, and I, I make huge mistakes. And we, we get to the editing room, and we cut the entire film, and then we realize, holy crap, the, 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 the highlight of the movie, nobody understands it. It's incomprehensible. I somehow miss the most important point of a film. But with digital, you can go back and take a 5D and, and go here and film the people or bring them. Or, I mean, it's amazing what you can do that you can't do with 35 millimeter if you're on a low budget. With 35 millimeter, we always, in fact, I met Woody Allen once and he said the same thing. He, he saved some money in the budget to, to film in post-production. But uh, for 35 millimeter, it becomes thousands of dollars. With the, with the digital, what, how nice is that? Did you can yeah. keep, keep fine tuning and filming. Yeah. You, you know, we take a long time to edit, uh, always. Uh, I mean, Poultry Guys took two, at least two years to write the script and another full year to produce, at least. It was at least and Tromeo and Juliet was five years to write the script. So we're pretty slow. We do pr produce other films with other directors who are more straightforward and know what they're going to do and uh, and by the time they come to us we've we've agreed on the script and all that kind of stuff but uh, it does take me a long time and the, th the digital revolution is really a democratization of filmmaking and allows you to do uh, have a lot more freedom and to not be rushed if you don't have it it's sort of liberating nobody wants our movies and that's very liberating because we don't have to deliver return to Newcomb high for christmas you know we finished shooting volume one basically back in august and september it's now january 
we 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 have finished shooting and we've got kind of a rough cut and uh, we'll be mixing probably toward the end of February. We'll have the movie finished, uh, but we we didn't you know we don't have to have a deadline because nobody wants our movies. Peter Jackson, that's his job. He's got to get the movie ready for Christmas. Yeah, that's got to be pretty stressful. Yeah. The big problem is is that since I've been in the business, since we started Troma in 1974, the industry has gotten so vertically integrated. All the rules that used to protect the public against monopoly. Yeah, and also not only making films, but you're also very active, you know, doing a lot of interviews like this one and taking a lot of time. Um, how are you able to keep so active without uh, stretching yourself too thin? Uh, when Michael Hers and I got trauma to the point where we didn't think we'd disappear uh we dis we we wanted to do what we could to encourage independent cinema uh and and uh so that the books are mainly for that purpose and uh i act in a lot of movies and uh i've been uh, trying to get a part in uh, the angry video game uh nerd film um, i did offer my lips like a woman to james but he, uh, so far, I haven't gotten anywhere, but I'm still hoping to get a part. Uh, and anything we can do to help the cause of independent cinema. And right now, we're we're hoping to make another documentary to go uh, to uh, go along with All the Love You Can, which we did 10 years ago. We're hoping to do another documentary teaching students about the, the importance of international film festivals as sales, sales tools, not just art, but selling your film and also to try to expose the uh, the hypocrisy of the Cannes Film Festival and the fact that it has become the private plaything of the giant uh, worldwide conglomerates. Another thing about independent films is that uh, they get compromised a lot, is that you know you have the idea in your head and you know exactly how it's supposed to be, but every day as soon as you start shooting, uh, you're facing all kinds of problems and it starts getting like watered down till it becomes a very different film than what you originally Imagine, even if it comes out real good and everybody likes it, still it's never going to live up to your imagination uh, and how good you you know you expected it to be. And uh, do you feel the same way um, when you're working on films? Like, do you deal with a lot of compromises? Well, certainly on a modest budget, um, you know, the Return to Newcomb High is got uh, thousands of uh, people. It's a very ambitious project. It's in two volumes. And in fact, volume two, we're still filming. So maybe we can get the angry video game nerd to play a cameo in volume two. That would be terrific. Uh, it, it's more, uh, I, I think that you have the kind of yin and yang. I majored in Chinese studies at Yale. And uh, you have the yin of total artistic freedom. We've had 40 years where nobody's been telling us what to do. But the Pascal uh, Paris, the bet, the bet is that the kind of bet that you make uh, is that you will make a movie for a small amount of money, so therefore you can't have honey wagons, you can't really feed the crew what you'd want to feed them. You have to sleep on the floor, eat cheese sandwiches three times a day, and learn how to defecate in a paper bag in order to work on a trauma movie. And um, we, we, you know, on the one hand, we don't shoot SAG, Screen Actors Guild, so we don't have to deal with... Uh, uh, if you shoot with somebody on a Monday and you and you don't use them until Friday and they're sitting around just picking their nose with SAG, you got to pay them for that time. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have to do that. When we filmed Return to Newcomb High, people were living in Niagara Falls, New York. We had about 80 people living there for two months, uh, and literally sleeping on mattresses on the floor in a funeral home. But we could anything that went wrong. We could say, okay, we can't shoot, uh, the costume is uh, n not ready, so we can shoot with those two people. Or, uh, oh, gee, um, uh, the, uh, we had uh, an outbreak of spider bites, oddly enough, uh, on uh, this movie. It was like Niagara Falls seems to be the uh, epicenter of spiders, all different types. And uh, we had two or three people that had to go to the hospital, so we couldn't use them on certain days. But we had everybody there, so we could say, okay, we'll shoot over here and cover sets and I don't think we had to compromise too much other than we obviously can't compete with uh, Inception in terms of the special effects. <laughs> but our, fan, our fans kind of enjoy the Brechtian aspect of trauma movies because they, they sort of enjoy being part of the creative. Uh, they, 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 uh, they understand that they can see backstage with our movies. They can see the, uh, the, the some of the makeup. Uh, they can see the... The bald caps don't quite work, or the 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 
blood coming out, the f- fluids coming out of people's ears, maybe they'll see a piece of tape. They they like that. They kind of like it. The, you know, it's part of the trauma uh, magic, the trauma technique. That we, it's it's Breck did the same. Bertolt Breck did the same thing. And Andy Warhol, I'm a big fan of Andy Warhol, and he would be doing a scene and all this, and suddenly the actor would, uh, Andy, I, I want to have lunch. I'm hungry. And Warhol would leave it in the movie. Uh, you know, he was he was terrific for that, uh, you know, that, that kind of... And I think the audience... I mean, I always liked that, to be kind of back, see backstage a little bit and behind the scenes. But that, the, 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 you do have to compromise. But better that than uh, Michael Bay. It seems, uh, you know, movies, our favorite art form, has been turned into such a big business, really. And, uh, you know, we have movies nowadays that cost, you know, more than $200 million and all kinds of, you know, obscene amounts. Um, do you feel that Hollywood makes it kind of difficult for uh, independent filmmakers to to be able to compete? You know, well, it's not just Hollywood. the The media is international. The conglomerates, the small number of of giant devil worshipping international conglomerates, are international. Sony's Japanese. Rupert Murdoch is from some planet. Uh, Sumner Redstone is the creation of Stan Winston. I mean, these people, these are a small number of, 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 of old, old, old people and conglomerates, and, and they control everything. And the rules that used to protect the public and used to let independents like us enter the market in the 70s and 80s, it's almost impossible to do that now because the rules have all been changed to, to help Viacom and help Sony and help to control the, the, the marketplace. And uh, we all better be real careful. I've written about this in my books and essays. We better protect net neutrality on the Internet because the big guys are down in Washington. The MPAA is spending $100 million a year to get rid of net neutrality. They don't want net neutrality. They do not want the free, open, and uh, democratic Internet. They want to control the Internet as, long as, as do the phone companies and the service and the uh, ISPs. So we need to fight and make sure that no more... Uh, no more of these um, laws uh, try to get sneaked in. They usually try around Christmas time when yeah. no people are asleep. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> you know, SOPA. So we were big on... Uh, Two Christmases ago, yeah. We, 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 cl- we closed down uh, the uh, Lloyd Kaufman fan site and other stuff, uh, to, uh, and as did uh, Google, I think. Oh, as the blackout thing when, when that was going on? Yeah. So, so I think we have to be very vigilant, but it is indeed uh, very, impo- very difficult to, to, um, to compete in this world. Uh, with the conglomerates. But uh, may I also suggest that the the line, it's interesting because the line between filmmaking and home movies, on the other hand, th- there's so many people making films yeah. that the line between filmmaking and home movies has been blurred. So you have, uh, you know, in other words, to get noticed, you have, um, for example, the, the uh, tender and uh, the, the searing uh, interracial... Uh, a controversial film uh, by uh, Kim Kardashian, uh, uh, superstar, which of course uh, Ryan Seacrest uh, made Kim Kardashian into a uh, uh, America's sweetheart, the uh, sex film basically. Uh, but uh, now she's America's sweetheart. And how about uh, um, the the beautiful love uh, story uh, created by Paris Hilton, uh, uh, One Night in Paris, or whatever it is? Uh, I, in other words, <laughs> it's a different world. The, the how you they got noticed. They sure as hell got noticed, but I don't think it's, uh, you know, helping the art of film. But at least you can get noticed. Uh, how did Justin Bieber get to be Justin Bieber? I believe it was just a YouTube video and uh, and uh, probably angry uh, video game nerd who uh, has immortalized, helped to immortalize. I know I've done my bit. Uh, I uh, discovered that he's wearing a training bra and that he stuffs it. That Not the angry video nerd, but Justin Bieber. Apparently he stuffs his training bra. I've done my little bit to help him. Yeah, um, when you're making an independent film, how do you uh, compete with all the options of what there is to watch? Because people have such a large choice. Um, what do you, you know, do to get, uh, to get noticed, really? Well, I think the most important thing is to make a film you believe in. It's an art form, and that's the easier ways to make money, right? You can be a congressman. Going to either, yeah, going to law school or become a doctor or something. Yeah, people going to independent filmmaking, no. You're going to go into debt if you do that. Well, also, don't expect to be rich. You can be rich. I mean, Harvey Weinstein's very rich, and Tom Cruise is very rich. And But most, uh, uh, you know, I mean, what are the odds of that? You have to, if you want to make a lot of money, 
you should not go into movie making. And if you want to make a lot of money in movie making, you probably ought to go and you want the Oscar and you want the cocaine and the hookers, go to uh, Hollywood and be part of the mainstream. But uh, it, it, I, I believe in the auteur theory of cinema, as do you, and um, we want to control our movies. As Shakespeare said, to thine own self be true. Uh, and he uh, also wrote that amazing uh, book, 101 Money-Making Screenplay Ideas, otherwise known as uh, Hamlet. Yeah, you know, um, talk about how it's changed when, um, you know, w with YouTube and everything, it's so easy to upload something to the Internet and get it out into the public. But before, it was just you s submit to film festivals, and that was really the only way. And it was usually kind of a blind guess. If you were going to get in or not, you'd pay the entry fee, and then... You wouldn't even get any feedback. You wouldn't really know. So, Well, when Michael Hers and I began Troma, there was only theaters. There were only cinemas. And um, 35 millimeter, uh, squeeze play, waitress, stuck on you, sugar cookies, uh, all these movies that we made in the 70s, um, they, they, we could compete in the theaters because they were building the multiplexes so we could get out there. There was no DVD, there was no VHS, no TV, none of that stuff for uh, independent cinema. Uh, and now there still is none of that stuff, thanks to the fact that uh, the FCC and uh, Clinton, actually Clinton and Reagan, uh, between the two of them, got rid of all the rules that opened up the field to uh, independent, uh, to truly independent filmmakers. Uh, so, so the Internet is a great, great place that the public, if you make something that is good, the public will find it. I mean, we've been doing it for 40 years. We don't have a huge fan base, but our fans are extremely loyal. They support anything we do. That's why if I'm in a, a, a new filmmaker's film and if there's no budget, I, I act for free. Um, and and the, the trauma fans will will support anything that's trauma related. And, um, and so that's really valuable. And word of mouth, there is no way that... that um, the, the major studios can buy word of mouth. They've tried. It, it doesn't work. And even when something works on the Internet, snakes on, the, on a plane is perfect because it had this huge Internet presence before the movie came out. But the, 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 the mainstream people, the cartel behind it, didn't know how to use it. And the movie sucked. And I don't know that it was commercially successful. I, I, I imagine that because it got on HBO and it, uh, that maybe it, it did all right. But it had, in other words... The, the Internet, the public will find, if it's interesting and different and, and uh, true to your heart and all that stuff, the public's pretty good about uh, finding, uh, it may take time. Combat Shock, one of Troma's best movies. We were a deficit on that for a long time. And um, we, um, we finally broke even about 15 years after uh, the movie was made. And um, Thanks to the, the word of mouth, Combat Shock actually is pretty... Pro it's, it's an evergreen for trauma. We, we keep making, not a lot, but a, a bit. And certainly when Cannibal the Musical came out, nobody got it. Uh, we were the only... St Trey Parker and Matt Stone had no interest. Trauma was the last stop on... They were fans of, of, of trauma, but they knew we were underground. But we were the only ones who got Cannibal the Musical. And um, once South Park came out, of course, Cannibal the Musical was a huge... Uh, a huge uh, home video success, as well as uh, in the theaters. And uh, thanks to the fact that Troma is blacklisted by most of the uh, TV stations, including Comedy Central, um, Cannibal the Musical has never been on TV, so American TV at least, so our home video keeps going pretty strong because uh, the uh, <laughs> people hate us. <Yeah. laughs> and they'll hate you too, don't worry, you see. No, no, they're going to like you. They will love you. If you were to do anything over again, would you ever go into a different genre or something? Or do you feel, you know, this is what it's meant to be? Or uh, It's a good question, James. I think the only regrets I have are when I've compromised. And I compromised on Toxie 2, Toxie 3, Sergeant Kabuki Man NYPD. Um, and I don't think we made any more money with them. And I don't think that we, um, we um, made better film because of the compromising. And I don't think we got a bigger audience. They're good movies. I mean, they, some people think Toxie Part 2, uh, the one we did in Japan, is the best of the Toxic Avenger. But to me, I see where I tried to make... And we had partners on those movies. And um, we had to get the R rating. We had to get an R rating. So we clearly had to compromise, and uh, and I regret it. Uh, Sergeant Kabuki Man NYPD, I talk about it in my books. Sergeant Kabuki Man NYPD, we had 
uh, Namco, the uh, video game, the Pac-Man, uh, yeah, and uh, uh, they were our partners, and they wanted a kind of a family-oriented <laughs> movie that they could. They had these little uh, amusement parks in Japan. They wanted Kabuki Man in those places so families could come and enjoy him. And I didn't get it. I didn't get it. So I kept pushing, no, he's got to eat the worms and we got to kill children. You know, the little babies have to be killed. And, and, and we sort of, you know, that we sort of compromised during the, they, they, they were very understanding and they let me do a lot that they didn't want. And I kind of shaved the, the corners a bit. And uh, I don't think it helped the movie. I think we didn't get a full fledged trauma movie and they sure didn't get the, the mainstream Kabuki man that they wanted. And, and I think the lesson is either you have total freedom, you just let yourself go and make some art, or you become a hired hand and, and uh, just do what they tell you to do and, and uh, take a big paycheck. And I think John Sayles does this. I think John Sayles and there are a few others who they'll make, one, they'll make a movie for the mainstream and they'll do whatever it is that is wanted, and then they'll go out and make a, a brilliant John Sayles movie. And um, last question, um, probably the one that has no answer. Um, going back to one of the first things I asked you, uh, I, you know, you talked about how hard it is to make films. You know, you have that burning desire to make a movie, but when you go to make a movie, you put yourself into debt, uh, you, you lose all your spare time, you, you lose touch with, uh, you know, personal loved ones, and uh, really, uh, making a film, it just takes over your life. So if people make films and, and you know, you get sick of it and everything, but still you want to make it, you want the end result, um, why, why do we make films? Well, it's, a, it's an art form, and uh, in the same way that uh, Picasso painted or um, Van Gogh uh, painted, uh, you want to give something in your soul to express it. Uh, um, you know, Kubrick uh, spent 10 years on Napoleon. He had a project called Napoleon, and he he had a, a file card. There's a dis, there's a, a show, a Kubrick show somewhere, and and it's in L.A. I think. And um, he had file cards for every day of Napoleon's life. He spent ten, he obsessed, obviously obsessed about it. I mean, I, again, I think you have to be a bit eccentric. I, I know that in my own personal life, I put filmmaking way ahead of my wife and family, and I regret doing it. But there was no other way to make the movie. And I've been married for almost 40 years. And my partner, Michael Hers and I have been together for 40 years. So some, and, and my close childhood friends, are, uh, I'm still with them or they're with me, however you want to put it. And I see that you guys uh, are uh, schoolmates and uh, your group has been together for a long time and are good buddies. And, uh, and I, I think that's kind of, if you can have sort of a base and um, and then build up, and you've got the fan base, so you really, it's very discouraging to be where Troma is. Forty years, nobody really, nobody. There's no the New York Times, for example. We've been making movies in New York for forty years and employing. Uh, you know, we've had a payroll. We own this building. We own the building on Ninth Avenue. We've got a, a library of eight hundred movies. We've probably produced a hundred of them, mainly in New York City, in New York area, New York City. Pretty much like in this area. Well, Manhattan, you know, we were in Manhattan for 30 years in, in, in Hell's Kitchen. And yet, New York Times, we had our 30th anniversary, not one, not even a line, you know. And when they review our movies, they review our movies in the shit department, you know, with that uh, section where they put uh, somebody's first movie or some documentary about left-handed mattress workers or, or you know, they put us That's in the... good one, the left-handed mattress worker. Was, they, New York Times gave that one a lot more attention than they gave Poultry Guy Snyder the Chicken Dead, even though the review was very good, but they, 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 they because we don't advertise, we can't, we have no money, how are we going to advertise? And we have one theater on Poultry Guys. Waitress opened in New York in 1980 with 92 theaters okay we could advertise and amortize we we we, we with, with one theater in new york uh, how much could we advertise and and uh, even so we had the highest grossing single screen in the country the day that poultry guys opened and yet now we beat speed racer which was the big movie that weekend and yet they yanked us out uh, i think uh, three weeks later or two after two weeks because indiana jones skullfucker needed every screen in the world so they kicked us out. And by the way, the good people at the Tribeca Film Festival, the very wonderful independent cinema festival, 
they wouldn't let us put the poster, they wouldn't let us put the Poultry Geist poster up the week before Poultry Geist was opening at the Clearview Cinemas downtown because uh, I don't know why. I have no idea. I'd love to know why they, they, they wouldn't let us put the uh, poster up. because You know, the Tribeca is supposed to be this independent New York-based. But this is what you go through if you don't, if you don't have a lot of money to uh, grease the skids. Well, anyway, Lloyd Kaufman, thank you so much for uh, for the interview and for inviting me to Troma and everything. This has been great. Uh, the Cinemassacre fans love Troma. And again, thank you, James, and the Cinemassacre fans uh, for supporting independent cinema. And I uh, know we at Troma can't wait to see uh, your film. And uh, uh, please uh, give me a part. And uh, I have lips like a woman. And I know how to use them. Okay. Okay.